Welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Dr Sarah Moulds, Senior Lecturer in Law at UniSA and one of the Deputy Chairs at IAPEN, the International Parliamentary Engagement Network, which co-hosts with the IPU, the Public Engagement Hub. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to this seminar on From Georgia to Indonesia, Legal Frameworks and Meaningful Public Participation. I'd like to acknowledge that I join you from Ghana land and pay my respects to the First Nations peoples, elders, past, present and emerging, and acknowledge the authority of any Aboriginal people in the audience today. This seminar is part of a series of seminars that explores issues of global public engagement with Parliament, following the publication of the Global Parliamentary Report on Public Engagement last March. Before introducing today's topic in more detail and introducing our wonderful speakers, just a few housekeeping rules. First of all, the seminar has translation available in French and Spanish through the interpretation button at the bottom of the screen. Can you please keep your mic muted when the speakers are presenting? But it's lovely to have the cameras on so we can see your smiling faces. And at the end of the presentations, there'll be the opportunity to ask questions and you can use the raise hand function um, in the reactions button where you can include your uh, question or comment in the chat function. Now, before I introduce our two wonderful guests, can I please invite Tamar Chugavoskvili from the IPU to say a few words about a wonderful comparative study her team has been working on, summarising legal regulations related to public engagement based on examples from 30 different countries. And once we hear from Tamar, we can move on to the seminar proper. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, so public uh, engagement hub, um, in public engagement hub, we have um, decided to look into how laws, constitutions and rules of procedures of parliament really regulate the pu public engagement in the, um, in the public engagement issue. And uh, even though in some countries uh, the tradition is very important and uh, many parliaments rely on the traditions that exist there, in most of the countries legislation is the key and the legislation, constitution and rules of procedure, um, they secure, they guarantee the um, citizen access, public access to um, parliamentary work. And we wanted to take a look um, at different countries and see what is really um, uh, happening and how is this how does these regulations work? And we have um, uh, conducted the uh, uh, this research. We have looked into this constitutional and legal, legal articles in thirty countries across six continents. So on this slide, you can see um, those countries which uh, have been analyzed and uh, these findings that we will present. Uh, now are based on this, um, uh, are covering quite a broad representation of countries and, and uh, continents, and we think that this can be um, uh, understood and seen as an um, uh, representing the uh, overall um, uh, legal back backgrounds, and this is how things are probably regulated elsewhere as well. This is a, uh, this is a quite a representative sample in our understanding. Uh, what we see from this uh, research is that uh, while there are legal bases and functions um, uh, in most countries for um, information disclosure and consultation in many countries, interactive communication and education uh, basically lacks, uh, lacks uh, legal backing. I should also say that um, taking into account that uh, 2022 Global Parliamentary re Report um, about public engagement in the work of uh, Parliament classifies public engagement in five key Hello. These are information, education, communication, consultation, and participation. So when looking into this uh, uh, survey and when doing this comparative research, we use the same standard. So we have classified these, the articles in the, uh, uh, in the same um, order. 
Uh, we can say, based on this research, that all 30 of the countries analyzed had a legal basis for information function, uh, which includes disclosing meetings, bills, and minutes, consultations such as public hearings and engagement with the expert and witnesses as legal grounds in 28 countries, and participation, which is related uh, to, uh, to a bottom-up participation, such as petitions as legal provisions in 30 countries. However, other than um, uh, for visitors, uh, they uh, there are a few legal provisions for communication, which um, uh, emphasizes interactive communication. There is no, and what is what is even more interesting, there is no basically a legal legal regulation of education, even though uh, it is work that is done in uh, basically all the uh, uh, parliaments that uh, we know. So there is some practice of education everywhere, but this is usually happening without legal regulations. Based on these um, uh, uh, assessments and looking into why um, uh, legal safeguards for public participation matters, we can draw the four, four main um, findings and four main lessons. Well, first of all, um, implementation is uh, assured if public engagement programs are spelled out in the constitution and laws. Uh, legal framework guarantees citizen access to information and inclusion in policy making. Um, for example, countries like Fiji, Kenya, Poland, and Uganda have constitutional provisions granting citizens um, access rights, emphasizing the importance of um, enacting engagement programs into law for effective implementation. Second, the ongoing execution of the um, programs can be guaranteed if provisions for public involvement programs are made in laws. Legal provisions categorizing programs as mandatory um, expenditures ensure stable fiscal resources, uh, enabling continuous evaluation and um, improvement, which is very important, especially that uh, many of the public engagement programs um, require proper funding and um, uh, resources to be um, uh, to be implemented effectively. Legal articles um, act as a driving force supporting the enhancement of programs and active public involvement in um, parliamentary activities and um, such uh, legal safeguards are, um, are key in this regard. Uh, third, the legal basis for public engagement can be an opportunity to draw more engagement with citizens. Uh, legal provisions on public engagement serve as the official channel connecting parliament and citizens, allowing access to information and participation um, policy making. Constitutional clauses in uh, countries like Fiji, Kenya, Uganda, and Zambia made, uh, mandate public participation serving as a foundation for increased engagement and even influencing the evaluation of evaluation criteria for legislative proposals, potentially enhancing uh, public involve, involve, involvement further. And fourth, and the probably uh, very important one, one of the most important uh, standards used by uh, courts uh, to determine whether legislative decisions that um, exclude citizens are legitimate is um, a legal provision. Uh, in 2021, uh, the Indonesian Constitutional Court, and we will um, hear more about this example from um, uh, Lumina, who is representing the Parliament of Indonesia, and will tell us more about this one. Um, and the Constitutional Court declared the job creation law uh, uh, partly illegal because it didn't follow the constitutional rules. Uh, it highlighted that citizens, academics, and union groups were not uh, properly involved in making this law. Without legal rules reflecting citizens' views, it is hard to check uh, laws passed without public input. Um, courts following laws can stop such laws if people aren't prop prop properly involved, um, indirectly ensuring public participation in decision making. And Indonesia is not the only example. There are others as well where um, the meaningful engagement was um, secured by the constitutional courts based on constitutional and legal provisions that and safeguards that have been provided in the legislation. Um, overall, legislation is uh, crucial for active public engagement in Parliament, especially in the countries where uh, traditions and history are not um, the um, 
key grounds which Parliament uses for its operation. And uh, in many countries, the um, uh, operation of Parliament in all areas, including public engagement, are heavily dependent on specific regulations and specific articles that are outlined in the uh, rules of procedures and laws. And uh, those um, articles and those regulations serve as a safeguard. So this means that Parliament Parliaments do not act um, based on how want to approach things, but they have to act based on the safeguards and guarantees that are provided in the legislation. And this um, uh, security, which uh, is there, um, is uh, uh, is very significant in most of the countries. Uh, that's why we wanted to look deeper into how these things um, are regulated um, uh, across uh, continents and across the parliaments. You can find more information on IPU's public engagement LinkedIn page, as I mentioned in the beginning. Um, so please uh, take a look, let us know what you think, or let us know if you have any questions or you would like to have more information about this. And I will stop um, here and um, uh, let our representatives from the Parliament of Georgia and Indonesia to share their experiences and um, uh, information about how things are working in uh, in those two countries. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tamar. Is this sound better um, now that I'm using the headset? I apologize um, if the sound was difficult at the beginning of the session. Thank you for bearing with me. So I'd like to introduce the first of our two excellent speakers uh, today. Nanuka Kurashavili is the Director of Democratic Institution Support Program at Georgian Young Lawyers Association. Nanuka is going to speak to us about her perspectives. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Sarah, and thank you everyone for joining us today. I would like to thank the organizers for organizing this um, very interesting and amazing um, uh, panel and also the, the events that is, I think, very much needed um, right now when it comes to parliaments. And also thank you for, uh, thank you to Tamar for an interesting presentation. It was very, very um, nice to hear about the analysis as well. Well, today I will um, try not to take up too much of your time and to leave um, big, uh, um, I think space for discussion, but I will give you, I, I want to give you, provide you with some information about what we do and how things uh, work when it comes to citizen participation in Georgian parliament. Um, well, uh, I lead a program at Georgian Young Law Association that is uh, focusing on institutional reforms. One of its main focuses is the parliamentary oversight mechanisms and parliamentary um, just generally how parliament works and um, the development so that we can be super reactive and also kind of um, we, we we also want to be engaged in the work of the parliament so therefore we are very active in monitoring its activities especially when it comes to democracy rule of law and human rights uh, i would like to first of all outline the fact that georgian parliament currently and the citizen participation in georgian parliament is um is very much codified in in the constitution as well as rules of procedure so uh this is i think is very very important when it comes to guaranteeing citizens rights to be engaged in a very important policy decisions when it's made uh, on the parliament level however um there are some issues when it comes to citizen engagement in Georgia, and I will dwell into it uh, at the end of my presentation. Um, but uh, before that, uh, I would like to outline the fact that Georgia started to uh, be more active, even, even more active with the citizen engagement in the parliamentary activities um, after 2017, when we had uh, the constitutional, we adopted constitutional amendments. And also during that time, and especially uh, in the uh, after 2012, uh, 10 and 11, uh, we became part of the open governance um, partnership and open governance partnership was very much um, supportive 
uh, of uh, inclusivity in in the parliament, in the decision making process and lawmaking. So a lot of the things that we will talk about today about Georgia are also because of the upper governance partnership and because of the civil engagement and so active inclusivity in, in the parliament. For example, um, because of the OGP process, uh, currently today we have um, a, a very digital uh, friendly environment when it comes to citizen participation and the parliament's website. Uh, prior to that, uh, of course, I was an analyst and from my personal experience, I can tell you that it was very difficult to find some draft laws and very difficult to find the agendas and everything else. But currently, because of this initiative, today we have a very user-friendly interface. Of course, there are some tricks uh, and challenges to it, but I will um, also give you some details on uh, <clears throat> on what can, citizens can do through this website. But it is also very user-friendly. You can see the agendas and you can see everything out front. You can very easily search for the things that you want to search for. And the second thing that is also, I think, is very important if utilized very um, effectively is the Citizen Cent Service Office that was just opened in 2022. And uh, it basically is a office in the parliament, in the entrance of the parliament, uh, specifically for citizens. When a citizen goes there, um, there is this uh, electronic screen that gives you all the information about citizen engagement possibilities that citizens can have when it comes to parliamentary work, as well as uh, some information about agendas on plenary um, sessions and the committee sessions. And they have more uh, information through the window consultations um, about what other things they can do to be engaged. There also uh, is a room for citizens to meet the MPs and meet, meet the staff of the parliament. So I think all of these things, if utilized well for the citizens, with this, uh, by the citizens, is very useful. But the thing is, the problem with uh, with all of these things, even the website and even the, the service thing and the OGP dig digitalization initiative, uh, is uh, the, the lack of information to the citizens. Because if you don't know if there are these kind of initiatives, if you don't know if there are uh, such mechanisms, you are not able to be engaged actively in the work of the parliament. But this is uh, this is the part of the OGP that I just wanted to mention that is still ongoing. Right now, Georgia has hit a little... Um, a little, a little challenging a period where we don't have an action plan uh, on OGP, but hopefully we will over overcome this. But to move uh, very quickly and to not to um, you know burn through my time here, uh, I would like to outline very important lawmaking, um, important mechanisms that citizens can be engaged in the lawmaking of the parliament. And this is, first of all, legislative initiative, legislative proposal, um, petition, and uh, these three things can be, um, well, fully utilized by citizens. Well, first of all, legislative initiative is um, is a uh, already a draft bill presented by no less than 25,000 uh, citizens. So this means that when they have the draft, the initiative group, has 25,000 signatures on on the legislative initiative, it can straight go to the parliament and parliament is obliged to uh, review this uh, draft bill and is obliged to discuss upon this uh, draft bill and make a decision. Uh, legislative proposal is more or less um, kind of the concept of the idea of the draft bill and the legislative pro proposal is initiated by someone submitted by someone to the parliament who uh, who doesn't have a right to initiate the initiative legislative initiative in the first place so all of the other people can um, can propose uh, can submit a legislative proposal including my organization for example Gaila has uh, submitted uh, many proposals, and we have uh, very we are very actively involved in the part of the parliamentary work. And whenever something very specific, whenever something problematic arises in the legal uh, sense of everything, we draft the amendments, we work on the recommendations, we draft the uh, amendments, and we submit it uh, to the parliament. And of course, it goes through the procedure, through the bureau of the parliament, through the committees of the parliament, and um, and then after. after after all of this, it is uh, finally it can be 
uh, presented to the to the plenary session after some some of the uh, some of the stages that I will not go into details right now. As for the petition, and it is also a very important uh, mechanism for a petition, there has to be 300 people uh, united and uh, should be signing this petition uh, to be um, to be uh, uh, discussed by by the committee of the parliament, and then at the end the the uh, plenary session. And the important thing is that if it reaches the plenary session then the, uh, the parliament is obliged to adopt a resolution or decree. So petition can be on um, any kind of issue that is permanent in the um, in the country, for example, about security, for example, about social rights. For example, we had some petitions about women's rights and um, uh, about the cruelty against animals and so on and so forth. So all of the things that people feel passionate about, petition is a right way to go. Uh, when it comes, when if they want uh, to draw attention attention on this issue to the par uh, of the parliament, and uh, important thing is also is that uh, the citizen is able through the website or through any uh, any other form through the emails that are all very public in the on the website to uh, ask the MP and present their idea to the MP and ask the MP to um, raise this issue in the parliament. So also this is a very important mechanism for them. I will also very quickly, I'm also watching my time here, I will also very quickly cover um, not only the lawmaking process and the, uh, the involvement of the citizens uh, citizens in the lawmaking process, but also uh, kind of an oversight mechanism, because we know that, of course, the parliaments have this uh, le uh, legislative function and the oversight mechanism over the executive, but I think it is also very smart that the legislation in Georgia also includes this type of um, uh, this type of involvement and functions for the citizens as well. So they are involved in the lawmaking. They are able to kind of um, put in their ideas. And also they are able to attend the plenary sessions. They are able to attend the committee hearings of the draft bills. So when they are when they are attending committee hearings, and this is a very easy uh, procedure, um, it is very easy procedure for them to just go onto the website or call the, the parliament hotline, for example, uh, if they cannot access the website and, um, and there is a point person for giving a pass um, uh, for, for this person to attend the committee hearing. And the thing is that when they are attending the committee hearing, they are given a right to speak and they are given a right to ask a question to uh, to the initiator of the draft bill. So this is also very important and interesting, uh, right, that citizens can have an exercise. And we as GAILA, we also uh, do this and we attend uh, committee hearings. And I think it is uh, it gives you more transparency in the parliament because a lot of the draft bills will just go uh, through the committees and go through the plenaries if uh, citizens and if uh, civil society organizations were not attending committee hearings because a lot of the issues are bringing uh, coming to the day of life because of uh, citizen engagement in this process. And um, I would like to also outline some very um, interesting things and practice, um, good practices that we had about citizen engagement. For example, in 2019, and this is uh, what I've talked about is uh, codified in law, right? This is codified in the constitution and through the rules of procedure of the parliament. But um, alternatively, we also have good practices that is just uh, based on uh, the goodwill of, uh, of of the political parties. And one uh, very interesting um, instance that I can remember is in 2019, when the Supreme Court judges were interviewed in the in the Parliament. And this is the procedure for Supreme Court judges to be appointed. And one of the stage was the interviews in the legal committee of the Parliament. It was very uh, it was public and also. Uh, people, citizens, were given the right to submit their questions to the judges, and the head of legal committee was able to read out the questions to the Supreme Court judges. So this is, I think, very unprecedented uh, moment when the Supreme Court judges are interviewed by the citizens, and they are given the chance to answer the, and uh, to ask questions to the Supreme Court, uh, possible Supreme Court judges. So this was a very good example of how how Parliament can exercise goodwill and ad hoc kind of um, engage citizens in, into this um, into this process. Um, 
I would also want to outline one very good practice that we used to have, but we don't have anymore. It is the parliamentary um, uh, parliamentary secretaries. So each organization that, that exercises, not each, but a lot of the organizations that have the function of monitoring a parliamentary activity, such as GAILA, um, we used to have in uh, parliamentary um, secretaries. Well, Gaila, uh, we don't have parliamentary secretary anymore, but this is for the institutional reasons. But recently, uh, because of a uh, very tense political uh, situation in Georgia, unfortunately, the organizations that had parliamentary secretaries based in the parliament, uh, and this was based on the uh, agreement between the organization and the parliament, uh, are no longer there. Their accreditation was... Um, no, they they were actually um, put out from the from the rooms that they had in the parliament by the reason of the fact that the parliament was under this room was under construction. Of course, a lot of time has passed and nobody has reached out for them to return uh, and continue their work as a monitors. But parliamentary secretary is a very important um, important aspect of the parliamentary work when it comes to CSOs, and we believe that. Having someone, uh, having someone who has a permanent pass, so you don't have to call up Parliament every time you need to go to Parliament and observe the situation. Uh, organizations have um, have uh, specific offices in the Parliament, or if they don't, they have permanent passes to the Parliament, so they can go through the security and go through this process very easily. And they are, uh, they are, um, uh, job description is basically observing and, uh, um, assessing the parliamentary work in every regard with the social aspect, with the healthcare, with, with every kind of work that they do. So, um, I think having parliamentary secretaries is, um, is a very good professional level of engagement of the CSOs in the in the parliament, even though currently we are experiencing some kind of uh, challenges in that regard. Um, well, That's I would stop here. It. Yeah. And um, thank you for listening. Uh, and think, if you have any questions, I'm curious to answer. Thank you so much, Nanika. That was really wonderful. And I'm sure there will be some questions that we can field at the end of the next presentation. I'd like now to introduce Lamina Mentari. Lamina is an expert staff for the Open Parliament Indonesia of the House of Representatives of the Republic of Indonesia. Thank you so much for joining us, Lamina. And I will pass over to you. And Lamina has a presentation that she's going to share her screen for. Thank you, Sarah, uh, for the introduction. Um, um, as um, like Georgia, Indonesia is also a part of the OGP uh, uh, movement. Um, and now uh, we have extended our uh, movement into the parliament. So uh, initially it was uh, parliament is just a part of the government uh, initiative, but now uh, we have our uh, our own standalone uh, initiative in pushing more transparency, participation, accountability, and innovation. So I have a very long presentation, but I will just jump into uh, uh, the, uh, the essential part of uh, this discussion. Um, so just a bit of uh, context of uh, or um, Just of let me background. know that sorry um oh thank you i think we're not quite at the presentation view of your um yeah. beautiful slide so yeah, yeah. almost there yes lovely so, thank you so just giving uh, a bit of uh, a bit of tapestry and context uh, uh, in regards of participation uh, in Indonesia. So we have a lot of mechanism and a lot of channels, uh, uh, whether it's digital or offline, uh, from our MPs committees and also our Secretary General. Uh, we have um, public forums, monitoring. We also have education for youth and uh, political education for Indigenous people and uh, in the districts. Um, and uh, we also uh, have an aspiration house. So uh, to give a, get, uh, a bit of context, because Indonesia has a very diverse uh, topography and uh, geography in, uh, in the area, uh, we tend to see that more effective offline uh, public participation is more 
favorable uh, for the public uh, rather than the digital ones. And that's why uh, we have an aspiration house program. So where uh, MPs could um, could build their own house and could conduct many uh, uh, many discussions. Many are in our case, it's named uh, Mushawara, which is um, a process for uh, uh, building concessions among uh, the districts and also a building concession among uh, political parties. And um, we also have um, a lot of application, and I'm sure IPU is already aware from the HDP. We have uh, information legislation system. We also have uh, CMAS PU to, uh, uh, to usually lawyers and experts and academicians will give their inputs or uh, expertise on certain regulations, uh, whether it's in the law, uh, in the lawmaking process or sectoral uh, substances. And uh, we also have our um, MPs participation canal, which is very specific uh, focus. Usually MPs like uh, Ms. Hatifa here will focus their uh, public participation in education and delivering more aid and delivering more um, uh, legislation towards uh, education. Uh, Ms. Lydia, for example, will we usually focus on political education, and Putri Komarudin is also active in IPU. Will focus and centralize uh, her uh, her uh, media social media activities on youth, and because we have so many channels, it's uh, it's difficult to focus on um, priorities and also to focus on the. A more essential part of the parliamentary function. And that's what uh, we came to problem here, where um, uh, where in the previous years, since 2019, we've been facing a lot of uh, backlash and a lot of protests from um, civil societies and the public in regards to certain legislation uh, that's are very sensitive and very politically heavy in uh, our country, and this is all uh, what is uh, uh, what been triggering us and ref and makes us reflect on uh, reforming these practices and as well as uh, reforming the mechanism for public participation uh, in Indonesia. And in this process uh, of controversial bill, I don't. I don't see it as, uh, you know, I see this as a blessing, um, actually, because it uh, really identified the gaps and uh, what we are still lacking in the parliament and even uh, the loopholes within the parliament and engagement with the government. Because a lot of this process uh, from the omnibus law of job creation and anti-corruption bills, and as well as um, now the criminal code bill, is that a lot of the, uh, a, a lot of the loopholes and a lot of uh, distrust comes from the government part of side. Uh, from the government stance. And now we as a parliament um, are trying to reform uh, our mechanism in building a more um, engaging uh, and more grounded parliament to the public. And um, we have uh, we have had a, a quite as a, Tamar said a landmark uh, progress uh, in building a meaningful participation amongst uh, the practices of uh, legislation formulation. Uh, and um, there are many revisions that are recommended by our constitutional courts, uh, whether it's the values of meaningful participation and as well as the process uh, in revamping the process of legislation formulations and how parliaments engage uh, in uh, the public. But the homework is not only uh, putting uh, um, just putting this recommendation, but also trying to uh, to pull to pull down this recommendation and make something um, that can be uh, reformative to the institution of the parliament and as well as our MPs. And this is why um, we we're in, uh, in the Secretary General and as well as the Parliament have uh, conducted um, many assessments with our CSOs and as well as um, experts uh, in this business. Uh, and we have formulated an inter internal regulation as a start to building a better uh, uh, public engagement process. And from that process from uh, the constitutional courts of law and now, uh, we've seen that there, there has 
there's still uh, a misconception amongst uh, parliamentarians and as well as uh, the public and to the definition between aspiration and, compla and complaint. Because sometimes when um, the public um, put their inputs in uh, our MPs or in uh, the channels or in the canals, um, it's very mixed. So um, they will complain about anything and everything and the discussion will go everywhere. And uh, this is why uh, uh, when we try to define this uh, this process and, this, uh, and, and the terminologies uh, for uh, this mechanism, it's very essential uh, to building a better process. And this is um, with the help of uh, uh, RCSO. So RCSOs and PMOs has helped uh, us build a better mechanism uh, for uh, a better engagement system and uh, public engagement system. Um, so in between, in um, uh, delivering those changes, there have uh, we have uh, divided our uh, jobs into four. Uh, uh, into four categories for absorbing, collecting, accommodating our uh, processing and uh, follow, on, follow up. And uh, we've seen that there's been a lot of bottleneck and a lot of gaps within these uh, four functions uh, when it comes to engaging inputs and parliamentary engagement, because a lot of uh, citizens give input, but sometimes our MPs have not have the time yet to respond or have not have the time to address uh, the in, uh, all of the ideas or the inputs or the complaints of the public. And uh, we've uh, mapped uh, where the problem lies. It's usually um, whether it's administrative problems or if it's uh, in uh, the system problem or if it's the MPs who are unwilling to address this, uh, uh, their complaints and these issues. So that's why um, we, have, um, uh, we have tried to identify how we can make a, a better business process uh, between uh, uh, engaging uh, these inputs and also engaging the MPs and, and building a better internal policies um, so that MPs could uh, uh, could have a better response system and re response mechanism to the public. And um, I think that is also important uh, to consolidate uh, this aspiration. Uh, usually we have an aspiration day uh, where uh, every day in a week we, uh, we focus on um, uh, the aspirations of uh, the people. And um, we usually involve a lot of CSOs and NGOs in that day. But um, now uh, we are still finding um, like a rhythm into the scheduling of uh, our MPs and the scheduling of our uh, uh, of other agendas. So that's um, that's like um, uh, still the, the the gist of the problem. And. As I said before, um, we also uh, conducted a, um, a study uh, whether the public prefer uh, a more digital engagement or a offline engagement. And Indonesia is still uh, prefer uh, a more uh, in offline or a direct engagement with MPs and institutions. So they need to have a person or uh, a human to engage them with uh, the issues or to hear their complaints. And usually they will come to the parliament or they will uh, conduct uh, a meeting with our MPs. Um, and this uh, may well be uh, our characteristic um, and just to uh, uh, you know balance between the digital side and um, a non-digital sides, because we know that if we uh, put uh, more offline meetings. I don't think we can uh, absorb a lot of inputs and a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, a lot of uh, opinions and arguments from the public as we uh, we would like to. And um, so uh, we also uh, have um, the open parliament uh, commitments as well as to push uh, this uh, legislation and regulation uh, more and more, uh, including in doing conducting a pilot projects and also seeing seeing whether where are still like the, the main problems or the main issues within our institution. And uh, and even if it's uh, if there are outside factor, for example, public distrust of the parliament, because um, our parliament is one of the lowest 
uh, uh, institute, public institution that have the lowest trust from the public. So it's become a bit difficult to build the trust and to build, uh, to trigger them to give more complaints because usually they will complain more to uh, the social media or other channels that can give them a direct response um, and a more engaging, uh, uh, you know, response. And um, we also, uh, uh, we also will try to integrate all of these processes also to the process of the government. Because a lot of the time, um, the complaints and the aspiration uh, to the parliament is sometimes lead to the government. And I know this because um, uh, it may be very different from other European countries because Indonesian is a, a presidential uh, system. So uh, there, there sometimes is a gap between the government and also the parliament, uh, whether in its coordinations or uh, operational works of uh, of uh, governing. So sometimes the public will uh, try to uh, complain about uh, the roads that are not working or the roads or plot uh, potholes or about uh, environment. It is something that's usually handled by the local government or um, the, uh, the central government. And then we usually send them to uh, to their government, but then again, the response and um, a mechanism sometimes um, lost along uh, these chains of, uh, you know, uh, these chains of uh, mechanism. So um, I would like to also uh, point out, uh, this is just a, um, a, just a quick draw uh, because a lot of uh, our, uh, problems with participation also is because um, a lot of youth are not uh, representing uh, uh, in the parliament. So we have a very low uh, youth representation that hopefully will uh, uh, will be uh, you know better in the next election. And this is why our parliament sometimes do not represent the majority of the public in regards to do, to demography and in regards to uh, you know priorities of issues and um, that's why uh, we are still very much pushing on um, on a youth uh, engagement and youth participation and um, there are uh, further uh, recommendations and further changes that that needs to be fixed in, in our parliament, especially in regards in engaging more of the public in regards in engaging the youth, and as well as um, building this dynamic of an uh, paradigm of openness. Because um, sometimes a lot of the complaints um, are usually uh, by people who are able, for example, or by people who can speak Indonesian. Um, a lot of, uh, like most people in the districts sometimes can only speak their indigenous language, and as well as um, uh, people who are disabled sometimes could not have access to the digital uh, uh, platforms. So that's why uh, we are also trying to engage a more inclusive digital pa uh, platform uh, for all of our, uh, uh, you know, um, for all of our websites and also social media, and. Um, and as well as building distrust. This is uh, very, very crucial uh, right now, since Indonesia uh, next year will face uh, a very big election. And hopefully all of these reforms can be inducted with the new MPs and the new uh, leadership of the parliament. And uh, we can um, probably send some IPEN studies as well to uh, the uh, our new MPs and in regards to, uh, you know, uh, build, building a better pro uh, process and practices in, in our parliament. So um, that's all for uh, from me. Uh, if there are any questions and maybe a uh, discussion, uh, please uh, give uh, some chats and all that. Thank you. Uh, terima kasih, uh, Lumina. Thank you so much. Um, we have uh, a, a, around just over 10 minutes for questions, which is fantastic for Nanuka and Lumina. Um, and there's a, a couple of thoughts in the chat, which is wonderful, but please use your virtual hand if you have a question. Maybe I can get started if I may. Um, 
In Australia, we've just recently had a constitutional referendum and part of that referendum was asking the people whether or not our First Nations Aboriginal people should have a special constitutional voice to the parliament, a special option for them, their voices to be heard in um, deliberations on laws. And I was interested in reflecting on the constitutional arrangements that um, both of you discussed and to ask you whether or not you think that those mechanisms do facilitate um, a genuine option for the voices of minorities to be heard, particularly people who might have been disenfranchised or dispossessed of political capital, um, perhaps through colonisation or other processes, um, or whether the measures that you've described so beautifully to us continue, I guess, to preference the voices of people that might have some privilege um, or be within the majority class. Um, so maybe you can think about that. Um, and I'll just take another question at the same time so you're not just answering mine. Um, uh, I can see Christina with a question. Did you want to um, go, Christina, and then we can throw to our speakers to answer. Thank you very much, Sarah, and thank you so much for um, all three presentations, really. I've got loads of questions, but um, I'm going to limit myself. Um, Nanuka, it was really, really interesting to hear about all the different mechanisms and the, the site and everything. I, I'd like, I'd love to see the site, actually, if you could put the link to the site in the in the chat that would be really helpful i, I realize it'll be in georgian but um i still like to to see it um can you can you just say whether um, can you just clarify the difference between the legislative proposal and the legislative initiative so you say the legislative proposal is similar but initiated by someone so you don't need the signatures and is there anything that compels mps or parliaments to consider it so what's the difference between the two of them you know to go through the procedures in parliament um, and my other question for you, Nanuka, was are the petitioners or the proposals of these initiatives also heard by MPs? So in the process, is there a mechanism to listen to the petitioners or to the initiators of these proposals? And to Lumina, also really interesting, um, I wonder whether you actually came to an agreement or what meaningful engagement is because it seems a lot of the activity you develop seems to be about complaints and how to deal with complaints and I wonder if those those four factors you identified the absorb collect processing follow up which is really interesting different functions whether that defines what meaningful engagement is but also whether that's different to members and members see it in different way and yeah sorry I'll have many more questions but I'll shut up now Wonderful. Nanuka, did you want to go first and then um, Lamina might be able to follow you with her responses? Thank you. Yes, so thank you so much for uh, those questions and I will uh, try to very briefly answer them, mindful of the time. Well, first of all, Sarah, to your question, um, I think, uh, yeah, these uh, initiatives and these mechanisms are um, utilized by the minority groups as well and not to also mention so they do not uh, largely prefer so to say the um the majority but because of the because of the you know the the limit of 25000 for example on initiative and so on and so forth it is much challenging, for example, for minorities to present the bill. But we have seen in Georgia's history the unity of um, of people on the on the very interesting and very important agenda. So, if um, if a um, proper um, raising awareness kind of campaign is is conducted, I think um, it can really work. This is for the initiatives and others, but. Uh, as for the committee and attending committee and plenary sessions, it is for anybody. So it doesn't really matter if you are interested in some issue and it is an issue for, um, doesn't matter on what uh, topic you can attend it. And it, there's no kind of limit to that. I would just um, add that uh, the the reason why utilization of this mechanism in Georgia, for example, they exist, but it is more utilized by the by the civil society organizations or activists um, and not regular citizens so to say 
is because of the lack of information, I would say. It's because of it is all utilized and it's all very central to the to, to the capital city. Um, and I would just say that there's there has to be more kind of information campaigns when it comes to citizen engagement. And also I would add that um, when they realize that the parliament, of course, is not the only citizen engagement kind of the, the, the hub for, for the country, uh, there was also created the uh, OGP local. That means the citizen engagement in the municipalities, in the city city assemblies. So people in the regions have the opportunities to be engaged and they are even more active actually than the people in the capital. They are even more active with the initiatives and to improve their community and community um, rules and everything else. So I think this, uh, this kind of mechanisms together work better. Um, to answer Christina's um, questions, the difference between the initiative and the, the pro uh, uh, proposal is, uh, well, initiative is basically a draft bill already, uh, but the legislative proposal, on the other hand, is can be a concept, can be um, a print on the level of principle, can be on the level of the opinion, and they just submit it. And once it is submitted, then it can be taken uh, upon by the AP, can be taken, it can be um, kind of discussed upon even more. So, um, but the first one is, essentially a draft bill that, that goes to the plenary session of the parliament and has the parliament has to decide upon it. And um, as for the authors, yes, the authors of the proposals are uh, are heard by the committee. For example, if Gaila uh, initiates the proposal, we have a right yeah. and uh, the, the chair of the committee can call upon us and ask for our opinion about a uh, draft bill. So we can uh, we can stand in the committee on the podium and uh, actually um, uh, give reasons why we think that this draft uh, bill or this uh, proposal should be considered by the parliament. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Lamina, I see you've got a, an additional question now in the chat, um, but uh, a follow up question to your um, discussion about the developments that happen in the context of the law of on job creation legislation and asking whether or not the reforms that were agitated then have flowed through into subsequent practice. So I think you're now at about four different questions, but we'll, I'm sure you can take it away and, and respond to some of them. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, I, I think I'm um, I'm just uh, turning off camera. So, sorry. Um, so for your first question, Sarah, um, I think it will be useful um, to build um, a constitution among uh, the indigenous people, and we we've we we can conduct um, some formulation as well in uh, in Indonesia. But unfortunately, uh, because it all all also depends on the context because uh in indonesia there's um like thousands of indigenous groups uh, right and when trying to accommodate um and trying to build uh rights and um uh, uh and uh in placing uh legislation among them uh it, it can be quite uh you know controversial because there are all a lot of uh, conflicting interests and as well and um and a lot of different historical contexts um so that is just like uh, what well, maybe uh, in the specific context of Australia or New Zealand, it, it might be uh, a bit different. But I, uh, but I think it's very, um, you know, it, it's very useful uh, to push more inclusive engagement uh, because uh, recently we we did have a lot of controversies regarding engagement using uh, indigenous language, for example, or uh, 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 most of like. There, there is like some MPs who doesn't want to do discussions or to do uh, a forum or hearing using in, uh, indigenous languages, even though most of the public forums are indigenous from the indigenous groups and uh, they have provided translations and all of that. And it's it becomes a very, uh, a, a kind of, it can become a very, uh, you know, complicated uh, mechanisms uh, for that uh, for, for that topic. So, uh, with that, and um, the second thing uh, from Christina, um, I think what I've mentioned in my PowerPoint is just one, uh, one part of the changes and reforms that we're we're doing. It's not the whole, uh, you know, process. We still need um, a lot of reforms, especially in regards to how our MPs, uh, you know, enact 
uh, their uh, you know practices. Uh, but this is what we could do as a secretary general, as a supporting system in the institution in uh, fixing the uh, processes inside uh, uh, inside the bureaucracy and inside uh, 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 you know um, inside the secretary general, and um, a lot of our MPs have been mentioning it, but it's more likely a jargon rather than something that they want to you know do some changes with or uh, or you know enact, and um, that's why we're starting from below so we want we want to um you know better process in the front line first and uh better process in uh in how uh the secretary can help uh the public first and then um more and all can roll down to um you know our mps and how uh, uh the mps can change the policies uh, within themselves so that's just uh this is quite a sensitive issues especially in regards to the uh, omnibus law and as i mentioned to tamara before that there's not really much changes frankly uh, uh after the constitutional court uh has been decided and uh because they still planning to do more omnibus law <laughs> Uh, regarding of health and in regards of uh you know um i think um also in the uh financial uh, pro uh in, the, in the financial regulation so there will be more omnibus law to come and uh the constitutional court is only uh you know giving recommendations that maybe uh, could help uh, their MPs, you know, better their mechanism in engaging with the public, and um, um, yeah, I um, I think that's uh, that's for me. As for the, I think uh, the the question from the forum. So what exactly has changed? Well, as I well as I said before, it's not much has changed. We're just hoping for the next term of uh, MPs could uh, you know. Uh, reform or could fix some of the laws, especially in regards of regulation formulation. Uh, but as for now, they have, uh, you know, some of our MPs in some of the regulation, uh, they have included some of the groups and some of the expertise group. For example, the uh, the electronic bill that we had previously, that is something that our MPs and also our uh, government want to fast track uh, and won't really, uh, you know, don't really include a lot of uh, public participation processes, but uh, a lot of our, uh, you know, CSOs and, um, and internal uh, in, the, in the parliament as well, trying to be more inclusive and just trying to break, break that, uh, you know, uh, break that change of uh, of fast tracking uh, legislation without consultation uh, from the public. So we have uh, we have uh, implemented some breaks and implemented some advocacy and lobbying to help slow down the process of uh, you know fast tracking legislation. So hopefully um, we have better mechanism next in the next term, uh, especially. But it also really depends on who is in charge uh, in the executive and as well as who is in charge in the parliament. And it's a very you know, politically heavy process, uh, but hopefully everything uh, will you know, uh, improve. Thank you so much. We're coming up to time, everybody. So we'll have to put a line under the questions, but I hope that you can continue to connect um, in different forums, including the IPEN Teams site, which you can be part of if you're a member of the IPEN. And we want everyone here to be a member of the IPEN, and they can do that by visiting the IPEN website. And if you're an IPEN member, you'll also find out about the next lot of seminars that we've got got coming up um, and you can also find out all the wonderful things that the IPU um, are working on and the seminars that they're hosting. So um, if you connect into IPEN and get um, our newsletter, you'll 
see uh, those upcoming seminars. There's some wonderful events happening in um, November um, with an IPEN showcase. And there's also an, a next lot of fantastic seminars happening um, early next year as well. So we want you to um, stay involved in those processes. Um, can I just uh, uh, thank uh, from the bottom of our hearts, the two wonderful speakers today, Nanuka and Lamina, can we give them a virtual clap? Um, that was really fantastic. Thank you for sharing your insights um, and experience with us. Um, and we look forward to continuing to connect with you and follow those developments um, through IPEN and IPU. And if the wonderful speakers could please stay on the line um, when we close this meeting, um, that would be wonderful.